Now, from Nathan, it's probably logical to move on to Jefferson next, but just briefly I want to discuss Frank Bowers, who, like Kate Marsh, is another player-determinate character when it comes to surviving Life is Strange, and also like Nathan and Madsen, an early red herring, I think, that becomes a target for Max and Chloe regarding Rachel. Now, there's a lot of psychological pain apparent in this game. You know, Joyce, Madsen, Nathan, Chloe, Principal Wells, the Fisherman, many characters exhibit a sort of anger and loss and pain undulating, undulating beneath the surface that is somewhat placeless and part and parcel with the discomfort and uncanniness of Arcadia Bay. But I feel this anger is exhibited most completely in the character of Frank, because for me, Frank is an angry man, but not in the psychotic Nathan sense, but rather in a very pained and human way. And as the game progresses, we realise that this is partly because Frank is in love with Rachel, and much like Chloe, if the player puts two and two together, we can strongly assume that it's an unrequited love. And like Chloe as well, um, Frank's antagonism throughout the game is largely a product of loss and, and not knowing what happened to Rachel. Now, Frank is one of the cogs and the catalysts of the Great Jefferson Conspiracy, and being a local dealer, he is the purveyor of the barbiturates that date rape young girls in the pursuit of the antagonist's strange artistic agenda, I suppose. And if you choose the appropriate dialogue options during the, ta during the tornado scene, we see Frank realise this and actually come to lament this. And it's also in this closing dialogue with Frank that we actually witness his true warmth and humanity for the first time as well. And it's facets of the game like this that make me really like Frank, because he is extremely angry at society and at, you know, Rachel's loss, but he does have a degree of humanity, and this humanity shines through in some small ways. Um, for example, he loves dogs, and this gives him some degree of depth, and, you know, he's also really quite lenient with Chloe and the money that she owes him, and I think it speaks volumes about whether you know, in his heart of hearts, he's actually capable of violence against his clients, and particularly with Chloe, who, whether he'd care to admit it or not, he actually has a lot of similarities with. Indeed, it's worth noting that Frank shows up at Chloe's funeral if you choose to sacrifice her, and in his own hermit-like fashion, he kind of keeps his distance from the quiet proceedings, and nonetheless, this kind of conveys this sort of compassion that he holds for people. I also think that it's really interesting that he refers to Rachel Amber as his lioness, uh, and this is a term that clearly has connotations with, you know, lions are like the king, the, you know, it's the, the top of the food chain of the jungle, um, of the desert, sorry, and, you know, I think it shows that Rachel Amber is the dominant between the two, and by extension, Frank is the, the passive. And digressing slightly, I think it's just another neat example of how Rachel Amber's character is established you know, in this game, um, purely by the opinions other people have of her and the way that they uh, discuss her. Uh, just on that note, I'm actually quite reluctant to discuss Rachel Amber in any depth because my opinions, um, you know, I like I said, I've only played Life is Strange proper and my opinions on her and my theories on her may well be contradicted by the events of Before the Storm, which I haven't yet played. But suffice it to say, Rachel seems like a very complicated and seemingly unknowable character, even by those close to her, and it seems on the surface she's also, you know, clearly strung along Chloe and Frank emotionally, and I suppose it will take the events of Before the Storm to ascertain precisely why that might be. But anyway, uh, back to Frank. So Frank is antagonistic, foremost because of Rachel's disappearance, as I've just mentioned, but he's also clearly a man who has fallen by the wayside and through the cracks in society. And I think he's a direct contrast, in fact a polar opposite, to the privilege exhibited by the Prescotts. We know that Frank is a drug dealer and a former delinquent from a very religious family, but it's clear that his decision to live in an RV, um, and as an outcast from society, is a very conscious decision, rather than by necessity. Um, and despite people referring to him as a loser and homeless and dangerous, I think that Frank is simply a man who has chosen freedom, rather than living by convention, and again, you know, he's this opposite to the ideals and values of the omnipresent Prescotts, and his reluctance to live on their turf, as it were. Indeed, I think 
the fact that Frank lives in a vehicle is very symbi- uh, symbolic of his freedom compared to the other residents of Arcadia Bay. And I think it's another parallel, actually, that I draw between him and Chloe, as her desires are in very many ways uh, embodied by Frank, albeit not, not in the same drug dealery way. Um, so Frank and Chloe are people that can't be owned by society or authority, and I think it's one of the sig- significant kind of... Um, allures of both of their characters so anyway that's about all i have to say about frank there are other characters in life of strange of course um you know we have daniel we have brooke we have samuel we have warren but personally despite their determinate behaviors i don't see too much overall contribution to the main story that deems them necessary to discuss and i'm very conscious that i've been talking for a long time already I will note, though, that I I personally really like Samuel. I found him quite interesting, and he seems to have some very weird precognition or something, the way he talks about things. He's very abstract. But aside from that, and, you know, we have stereotype scenarios such as Warren being stuck in the friend zone, which really reminded me of um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt in 10 Things I Hear About You. And, you know, we have these secondary and tertiary story arcs. Um, I don't feel they warrant as much attention, so I'm going to kind of skirt over those and discuss the the primary antagonist of Life is Strange. 